You are listening to the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack, the other co-host, man seen walking out of Barber Lounge 459 with a big old smile on his face. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. He is Scott Bowie. What's going on, Aaron? Not much. How are you? Doing good. You'll see me at Barber Lounge 459 sometime this week. We'll see you at Barber Lounge 459 this week. And next week, we will see you at McGilvery's Pub and Eatery on Tuesday, September 17th. Or 27th. (laughs) Tuesday, September 27th. (laughs) Yes, you will. At um, 7 to 8 p.m. Um, in Speedway, Indiana. So please come out if you're in the area. And um, Scott will be there. And I I will be there as well. Sorry to disappoint people, but I will also be there. Man, you're the fan favorite. I don't you're know about that. Everybody will be coming to see. No. It's not what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> but no, should be a good time. Look forward to it. Um so like I said, seven to nine, it's seven to eight. I'm all mixed up tonight. Seven to eight p.m. Tuesday, September twenty seventh, McGilvery's Pub and Eatery. Please come out. Yeah, uh, please do. And it uh, looking to have a lot of fun. As, I, as I've said in the past, and uh, we are working on getting our lineup of guests. Um, we have David Land. Who has committed? Um, David Land. David Land, the man, David Land. And then uh, we have uh, another person that's committed, but he may not be able to show up. So we're going to hold off on that. And if he can't do it, we've got a couple other ideas. So, but yeah, so we'll have a couple of guests and uh, just looking to have a good time. Absolutely. A lot of things um, really in the works, but. Um, on Monday, I released the Antron Brown video. So we talked about I got to spend some time with him and the team on Friday of U.S. Nationals weekend. Great experience. Um, got to do a follow-up interview with them as well. So I released a video on Monday. So definitely check that out. Antron's a great guy. Like we have said multiple times, Scott um, will walk, will run through a brick wall for him at some point. At some point, yeah. A metaphorical brick wall, but nonetheless, a brick wall. So, um, yeah. And then um, working on a deal to do some other go-kart videos here very soon. So looking forward to that. Um, Have a couple people lined up for that already as well. So a lot of good things for sure in the works. Yeah, no, I agree. A lot of irons in the fire for sure. And we got... uh, a good show for people today. Kristen Fittipaldi, returning guest. Great guy, man. I tell you what. Um, he, I mean, he was just so open the first time we had him, right? We had him on for a little while and um, just just great guy. And he was like, yeah, part two anytime. So um, we had to have him on for part two. It's been, a, it's been several months. It's been a little bit. But um, yeah, gr- great talk. Um, it, this one, I mean, you know, the first one, was a little more you know kind of plan like it's you know general like how'd you get into racing all that but this one since we've already had them on was a lot looser um a lot of different conversation talked about a lot of different things anything from him just driving down the road and how he just perceives people driving around him and how he like you know someone will be driving bad i'll be like man that person does not know how to take a corner <laughs> Or, right. you know, something like that. It's just great, man. I, I love Kristen. He's a great guy. And we were talking about the Alex Palou deal for a while, and he had some really good insight. Um, and when you look at him, I mean, Kristen was a great race car driver, someone who drove in literally. I mean, there's really not that many drivers out there, I don't think, that has driven in as many major forms of motorsports as he has. I mean, he's driven Very IndyCar, oh, car, IndyCar, whatever, NASCAR, Formula One, IMSA. I mean, that's those are the the major hitters, and there's not very many people who have who have done that. So, um, great race car driver, you know Newman Haas. He had some great stories about Carl Haas. 
<laughs> really <laughs> great stories. Um, but great guy. I love Christopher DePauli. So thank you so much for him for always having the time to come on. Um, yeah, what a good dude. And he, I'll say this, man, like uh, we talked about, of course, now the Alex Pelot situation is really kind of past tense because, yeah. hey, guys, I'm back. I'm with Ganassi. And he's happy. Uh, he is happy. He's happy. Uh, but good for him, it, man. Good for that guy. Uh, but he uh, he really did have some pointed views, and and uh, I I mean I for one appreciated his views because he's one of the few people who can really you know discuss what it is to to have contracts and you know work within those environments, and uh, so yeah, so that, that's a good section. And he, like you said, he had some great stories about Carl Haas. And, uh, it was like, man, it was just a great talk. He and he is very generous. Yes, absolutely. Very generous with his time. Um, and he offered that we can have him on again sometime. So we, we definitely will. Um, and hopefully we can have him do one of the go-kart videos <laughs> as we talked to him about as well. Yeah. I think that would be uh really, really fun. Yes. It would be very fun. So um, next week, our guest next week is going to be none other than Gary Gerald. Um, for those who do not know Gary Gerald, if you watch IndyCar races, I mean, really in the 90s, 80s, 90s, I think, maybe early 2000s, he was a pit reporter. Um, and, I mean, just did did a lot for the sport and was around, around a lot longer than I really realized. You know, some of the stories he had um, – really surprised me i think that you know a lot of people will really enjoy it and he does uh radio for the uh, sacramento kings has done radio for the kings for a long time um you know so and i and like i told him i think that's really cool um just from the standpoint of for so many people you know those guys bring a lot of joy into so many people's lives through their broadcast of those games um you know, and, and I didn't really think about too much at the time, but I mean, you, you think about like say an older person who maybe don't have the family around like they used to. And after a huge fan that, you know, that's one voice that they can count on hearing. Um, or even a younger person, say you move to a new city and you don't have a lot of friends yet or whatever. And, you know, that is one thing you can kind of count on is hearing these kind of same voices and absolutely you know, and that type of thing. So I, I think what he does and people like him do, I think it's just great work so, and, uh, and, and exciting and fun <laughs> and all those things. So I do have to give a shout out because I, I received a direct message on our podcast page back on August 3rd at 9, 17 PM. Um, an individual named Joss Alessandro, Alessandro, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, who, listens to the show so we appreciate it joss and he actually asked if we took requests and i was like sure um and one of the people he requested was gary gerald so joss thank you for the recommendation um i i definitely i I definitely knew who gary gerald was but i was like that's that's a good idea let me try to get a hold of him so thank you joss thank you for listening if you're still listening at this point thank you here's gary gerald just for you (laughs) Yeah, thank you. And uh, if you got any more ideas, just send them to Aaron. Yeah, just send them away. We take requests. And if you know how to get a hold of any of these people, we take that as well. <laughs> the, but no, no, it'll it, it's definitely it'll be a good a good talk um, for sure for people to listen to. Um, but as far as racing news, obviously IndyCar off season. Um, just have the, the victory, whatever you call the victory banquet for the championship banquet or whatever, um, this past weekend, I think you said, right, Scott? Yeah. As far as I know, it was at the speedway, uh, at the museum this mm-hmm. past weekend. Um, I'm kind of the mind that, Hey, if your racing series is a big deal, maybe your banquet should be a big deal too. Um, I kind of had a, a thought that that was what was happening at speedway when I saw cars pulling in after six o'clock or late, late, later in the right. afternoon. And then, uh, so they might want to advertise that a little bit more, but well, I don't think he's open uh, to the public. No, but it, I think, you know, honestly, it should probably be on YouTube at least. 
Yeah. Oh, I agree. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I think I, you and I were talking the other day, and, and I know this is kind of how something Robin said quite often, you're only as, as valuable as you present yourself. Well, you know, you know, it'd be nice if the fans could kind of maybe see the, the banquet at the end of the year. Uh, but whatever, that's nitpicking. Uh, congratulations on the champion. And congratulations to the champion team and all the people who worked tirelessly all year to help get them there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, other racing news. So NASCAR raced at Bristol. Chris Busser won. I did not watch the race. I do apologize. Chris B- Busser won. Chase Elliott finished second. William Byron finished third. A lot of uh, a lot of technical issues with the cars. A lot of, I guess, parts failures. I think that's to be expected. You know, the, I don't know how much. You know, I don't know how much racing they did. Like, you know, just mile testing and loading the cars, and you know, it's one thing to do it, and it's one thing to do it on a computer. It's kind of another thing to do it maybe on the chassis dyno or or what have you. Real life is a whole different thing. And um, so there was some issues. Bristol obviously is going to be very tough on equipment uh, just because of the banking and the speeds and all of that. But they'll get it handled. Um, man, other than that, I have F1 was off. Uh, USAC, the uh, sprint cars, they ran, uh, they ran a couple of races. Uh, they ran at... Circle City Speedway here in Indianapolis. And the winter is absolutely slipping my mind at the moment. But I can tell you, Jaden Rogers won at Hopstadt. Um, so that was his first USAC win. Congratulations to him. And uh, pretty safe weekend. My, uh, my nephew did not have a good weekend. He crashed really hard. Destroyed his car. But he's all right. Uh, so... He is on the mend, um, but that's about all the racing news I got. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy racing season. It seemed like it just started, but race season is winding down. We're getting into the the colder months, and, um, you know, it, it will be getting colder, obviously. And uh, air conditioning no longer is a thing. Not running as much, but but thankfully. But... Scott Bally will be staying warm this winter, won't you? Thanks to the good folks at Good Guys. As they uh, have done a checkup on my furnace, everything is good. They have repaired it in the past. Uh, They have kept me cool during the summer. They will keep me warm in the winter. That's a two-for-one deal. That that is a two-for-one deal. That's a great deal. That is. Uh, But, yeah, no, thanks to Ryan and everybody there. Uh, if you got any concrete work out in Arizona, Scottsdale area, Concrete Cowboys, Jace Jones, he'll do great work for you. Um, you got anything you want to plug? Well, live show, September 27th, 7 8 p.m., McGillivray's Pub and Eater in Speedway, Indiana. Please come out. Quick shout out to, you know, some of our partners. Top Gun Racing and Grand King Racing. Um, thank you for helping us put together. And also, they will be a sponsor of that show, as well as Racer Collect and um, Good Guys Heating and Cooling. That's right. <laughs> so, no, yeah. Thanks to everybody that's helped put us together. Uh, thanks to the people at McGillery's. And yeah. uh, looking forward to it. Yep, absolutely. And I will plug on november 12th and 13th i think i have those dates right november 12th and 13th um we i will be a part of this race racer is a part of this um this the speaking event with randy lanier at the grand king race shops um it's going to be a great time we're bringing randy in for it um so it's he's going to be signing his book as well so it's going to be a speaking event and he will be signing his book and if you are interested in it i did post the flyer on our social media so please um check that out but it is 11th and 12th so i do apologize november i have my dates all mixed <laughs> up tonight 
Friday and Saturday. So Friday, November 11th and Saturday, November 12th. Um, it's the show is in the evening on both nights. So, um, yeah, definitely, you know, as seen on Netflix and on um, Dale Jr.'s podcast and on the Racer to Racer podcast, Randy Lanier. Yep. All the best places. Yep. So in his book, which we've talked about, definitely check it out. Survival of the Fastest. Great read. This is the first book I've read probably since high school. So, and I read it in two days. So it's a great book. So definitely check it out. Is there anything else, Scott? I got nothing else. I just hope everybody has a great uh, week and hope they take care. Our guest today is a returning guest. We had him on several months ago. Um, he drove an IndyCar, Formula One, and NASCAR. We're joined again by Kristen Fittipaldi. Kristen, it's always an honor to have you on. Um, you know, yours is someone who was involved in motorsports for many years, drove and pretty much every major form of motorsport, right? So uh, it's it's really cool to have you back on. No, thank you. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be with you guys again. And um, I probably didn't screw up too much the first time because if you if you if you uh, rang me again to come back again, that means it probably went pretty well the first time. So let's do it again <laughs> the second time. <laughs> and let's see how it goes. <laughs> well, that means we did pretty good because you answered the email. That's true. So, I mean, it's a trade-off, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Got it. I could have always ignored the emails, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put that right in spam. That's funny. So, um, so I, what have you been up to the past few months? So, I saw that um, – so, you're still involved with the IMSA team, correct? Yeah, exactly. Still involved with uh, Mustang Sampling. And uh, we have one more race to go this year, which is uh, obviously Road Atlanta. And we're basically trying to figure out what we're going to do uh, for next year. Right now, it's, it's pretty tough out there um, because uh, everyone is, is, is expecting big changes with the new car for next year. So you're a little bit in a limbo and, and it's hard for you. It's okay, I'm going this direction or I'm going th that direction. And uh, so that I think makes it a little bit more complicated, but um, hopefully we're going to make the right decision and uh, it's going to be good and healthy and, and fun once again. So I saw IMSA did announce that they're going to return back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And I guess you've raced the, you were probably raced the Grand Am cars when they raced there, right? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was Grand Am. I, I don't. And then the was. following year was IMSA. But I think when I won the race with Joao, it was still Grand Am. It, it wasn't the first year of IMSA. Then we went back to first year of IMSA. And um, we had a mechanical right in the beginning of the race. And, and, and that was it. And then after... Because IMSA started in 14, if I'm not mistaken, when, when they joined together with uh, Grand Am. And then after 14, we never went back to Indy again. Oh. Was, uh, you know, was endurance racing something that you took to quickly? I mean, or is that something that became like an acquired taste? Because obviously it's such a different type of racing. Yeah, in some ways it is, but in a lot of other ways it isn't. Um, a lot of people think about it like it, because of the nature of the name. When you mention endurance races, right. that means like long distance races and you're really taking your time out there and, and really um, making sure that the car stays in one piece and stays healthy and you don't have any mechanical uh, issues out there. So, yeah. I, I agree in a way it used to be a lot like this, but nowadays it isn't because the cars are so well prepared nowadays that it's pretty much wide open from the beginning right. until the end. And, and realistically, ever since, if I'm not mistaken, ever since even the first IMSA race in 14 when we won uh, Daytona, pretty much the only restriction we had was, hey, just don't hit anyone out there. And the rest is up to you. You, you know pretty much how to pace yourself. Obviously, we're going to be giving you the differences 
uh, whoever is ahead or if there's no one ahead of you, whoever is behind you. And if the guy is catching up with you, how comfortable the car is. And um, I don't remember having any, any restrictions whatsoever as far as how I needed to treat the material. It was like the limitation factor was don't screw up, just don't hit a slower car out there when you're when, when you're when you're obviously lapping someone after a couple of laps like in Daytona after you get the green lights you're pretty much lapping people every every what like uh two three cars at least like uh every lap if not more so that was the only limiting factor so going back to your original question that I, I sort of sidetracked a little bit from it yeah it's endurance races but at the same time it isn't because you're pretty much wide open all the time and and then when we go into the sprint races when we go into the long beaches and detroits and, and this and that let's not even talk about that like that is definitely game on from lap one until the very last lap like it's it's exactly like a a uh, indy car race so yeah it's endurance races but i honestly didn't I never saw it this way. Now I know you're officially like retired, right? But do you do any testing at all with no. IMSA at all? Or no, 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 no. I I did my last race, and then after my last race, I I did a couple of laps in a Formula Three car. It had been like God knows, like twenty five years or whatever, uh, a huge amount of time since I hadn't driven a a Formula Three. Then. Uh, I took a couple of laps on a on a P3 car uh, owned by a friend of mine, um, and and that was pretty much it. Like the end of last year here in Brazil, uh, I did a couple of laps in a in a, a Porsche uh, in uh, like Interlagos, but uh, nothing serious. So I was watching Rapid Response, and I don't know if you've seen it, but they obviously they talk about you in rapid response. Um, I think it was with a Hans device. Um, when they were testing the Hans device, they said they, they went to you. Um, I think it was a Hans device. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they went to you um, because they said you were like one of the pickiest drivers. So Dr. Olvi um, consulted with you and the IndyCar guys. And I think Trammell um, about the Hans device because they said you were like one of the pickiest drivers. Well, I hope you mentioned pickiest drivers like in a good way. <laughs> yeah, and I think and no, no, I think no, they were but, saying no, like no, they could please uh, you. Like I no, think no, they were no, saying no, like I'm only joking, you. honestly. Yeah. Like uh, I'm only joking here. But um <laughs> basically what happened with the Hans, Dr. Hubbard approached uh, Carl Haas after when was it? I'm trying to remember after if I'm not mistaken. Uh yeah, it was sometime in 90, in the off season of 98 to 99. And then in January 99, we started running the Hans device in Sebring. And, and Carl allowed Dr. Hubbard to pretty much test with us at the end of the day. I, I think he gave him an allotment of 10 laps or whatever, like two, three outings. Um, mm -hmm. So he had that opportunity to mess around with the Hans. And, and what happened there is the first original Hans was only the piece that went around the belts. You right. didn't even have like the back part strapped on. Once Michael and I, we were comfortable with the piece going around the belts, then we moved on to the back part. And then once we were comfortable with the back part, as far as breaking going on the power and and how much your 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 head was moving inside the cockpit then we we strapped uh, the uh, tethers and uh, pretty much went from there so the whole process took a couple of test sessions it wasn't okay let's go out on the first day on on a thursday at the end of the day and then we'll nail everything on friday like it it didn't happen that way it I, I, and I think it happened a couple of times in Sebring while we were there testing, uh, winter testing for 99. Um, then there was some talks of us running it in Michigan uh, in 99. And then 
pretty much what happened is we continued developing it, but obviously at a slower rate because it got crazy throughout the year with all the races and serious testing and all that stuff. And unfortunately, uh, fortunately for the Hans device, but obviously, unfortunately for the situation, um, is after Greg's accident, it, it accelerated the whole implementation of, hey, guys, wake up. We need to start using this today. And our first race was mandated in Michigan in 2000, if I'm not mistaken. That was the first time that we wore the Hans device. And then after that, we slowly migrated not only to the oval tracks, but also to the road courses and then finally street courses. And then if I'm not mistaken, in 2001, it was it was full blown Hans device everywhere. I remember in the beginning, it was um, you had to use it in 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 the ovals, but it wasn't mandatory in the street and road courses. And I, I don't remember exactly at which point we started using it in the street courses and and the road courses. So again, sorry, I got sidetracked a little bit from your original question but um going back to it pretty much like it was a combination of of uh, four people there it was like dr hubbard uh obviously feeding back with with dr tremo and and dr olvi so they were on the medical side then carl haas Thank you very much for, for allowing Dr. Hubbard to, to use your testing time for us to develop it. And then Michael and myself, um, because in those days we were pretty much every week down in Sebring in the off season. And the way Newman Haas ran, ran their operation is uh, I went one week and then Michael did the next week. I went one week and then Michael did the next week. We never had two cars running at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, that's pretty much how we uh, developed the, the Hans device. You know, you mentioned Carl Haas and, and um, kind of oddly, and I think maybe because of the split, uh, he's not mentioned quite in the same vein as Ganassi and, and uh, Roger, uh, but kind of talked to a little bit what it was like. And obviously Paul Newman's there as well, but what it was like to drive for Carl? Great. Uh, absolutely awesome. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. Very, very seldom there, there were the difficult days, but uh, that's normal of of relationships with human beings, like right. being your wife, being your girlfriend, being your friend, being your uh, employer. Like it doesn't matter who it is. Like you are going to have better days and you're, you are going to have worse days. But um, if, if I had some difficult days, like probably there were one or two throughout my seven years that I had there and, and everything that I cherish from Newman Haas is only, only good times, uh, great friendships with a lot of people. And um, it was like a family. It, it was exactly how it was advertised. <laughs> like Newman Haas is a family. Yes, it, it was exactly like that. Like uh, the average Newman Haas um, guy that was working down there was, was at least, what, what, five, ten years. A lot of them even more. And you really had to screw up for you to be uh, fired on the spot by Carl or, or Paul. Like uh, if you were competitive in, in what you were supposed to do, you pretty much were part of the family and you were going to stay there as long as you wanted or as long as you were competitive, as long as you were doing your job properly. Uh, that was one of in my opinion, one of the keys to the success over there because the, the group was really tight and they knew each other very well. And uh, that was, in my opinion, a key to success. You, you weren't fluctuating, you weren't changing people every now and then, you weren't coming in with 
new mechanics, new engineers, new this and that, and, and you weren't making the whole stable, um, stable, I mean, like the whole shop, for example, you, you weren't unsettling the rack, like everything was, was pretty much solid. And, and when you get into those situations that you have a solid working environment around you, the chances of you collecting like some some uh, positive results are are huge because the sport is already hard enough um, when your environment is not positive around you. Uh, right. So you, you need to find the difference. You need to execute extremely well somewhere to say, okay, I need to be better than other people in this area in order to succeed. And, and, and this is what I think Newman Haas really was, was after over there. Like, like their human power was, was unbelievably strong. And, and I think because of that, uh, they ended up being really successful. And if you ask me in a couple of words, okay, why weren't they more successful? Because uh, sometimes I, I, I really thought that they should have been more successful. I think that um, basically some decisions that Carl made, and because he was an extremely loyal person, when he stuck to a manufacturer, and either if the manufacturer was going well or bad, he pretty much like rode the wave and and <laughs> i think exactly because of that it it may be made it hard on human Haas as far as wow if we went with maybe the other tire manufacturer if we went with the other engine manufacturer if we went with the other chassis manufacturer maybe we would have had more success yes probably yes but um that was one of the highlights that uh, Carl had, like he was ex an extremely loyal person. Yeah, it, and that's very rare. It's very rare in motorsport. Oh, don't don't even start. Don't go right. there. I, I I concur <laughs> like a million percent with you. That is extremely rare. Uh, yeah, it um, man, it's just you know, it's hard to grasp. IndyCar is great today. You know, it truly is. I mean, look at the top 10 of points and look at the, the, the variety of teams, you know, all the different teams where they start, where the drivers are starting during the race and how they're finishing. It's, you know, it's a mix of all the teams. But, man, IndyCar and those kart days, wow. The, the, the power, of the, I mean, the, every team was great. I mean, that's the crazy part. And they all had great sponsors and, were well run and I mean it was so competitive and uh, they're they're just you know in the last five years kind of gotten back to that I feel an IndyCar today um, and so yeah the lack of success may but also at the same time man everybody else is trying to win too right <laughs> I mean well yeah you know you, you know, funny enough that you just mentioned that I, I uh, bumped into Tracy a good while ago. I can't even remember where it was, if it was in Daytona, if it was some other place. And then we were like remembering our, our good old times from the 90s. And, and then we looked at each other and then we said, wow, we were happy and we didn't know about it. And we were right. always complaining uh, financial situation in general in the series was extremely good. Like everyone was very, very healthy. Just look at the amount of motorhomes, like in the paddock. It was, it was unreal. Yeah. The amount of testing that we were doing, like probably all the big teams had had a independent testing. At least we did, and and that was completely devoted only only to testing. So yeah going back to that we were really happy and 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 the only thing we did was complain <laughs> right but 
again, I, I think it's part of the human being nature. Like I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at myself, sure. at him, at this or that. And, and a little bit of that, I think it was our age. Um, we well, were everybody all. Everybody wants to win too. I mean, yeah, you we, we, win. No, we were all. Everybody wants to you're there. Yeah, no, but and 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 we were always trying our very best. Like, right, we were buddies, but yeah, but Paul wanted to go to the track, and he wanted to destroy me. I wanted to destroy him. Uh, the same way I wanted to do the same thing with Michael, and vice versa, and Max. Like, that's exactly why we got hired. We got hired to go fast. We didn't get hired to go slow. Um, and and there's something that. I learned a lot with Carl and has to do with what you mentioned is every, not, not every time, but a lot of the times I, I, I walked into the motorhome, he looked at me and then he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, son, I wish I had your body with my experience. <laughs> and, and then I looked at him and I sort of smiled, but I didn't know what to answer him. And and then I said, well, after we both turned around, like he walked away one way and I walked away the other way. I, I started joking to myself and say, well, what the heck is this guy talking about? And, and nowadays that I'm a lot older, like I have a daughter and, and, and the whole scenario changed and a family and this and that. I understand exactly what he he mentioned like and and yeah if if i could go back in my life i wish i had my 25 year old body with with my experience nowadays but having said that i'm pretty sure you're going to say the same thing everyone that lives everyone that gets older older and older is obviously going to say the same thing well, I am wiser, but I still have basically the same body. It's just horrible. <laughs> it's been horrible for years. Well, so, uh, you know, I, do you know what? I also mean in the sense like, okay, I, nowadays I get hurt. Before I used to get hurt and I like I would like, okay, in, in, in two days or in one day I'm, I'm, I'm uh, up and rolling again. Like nowadays – the same damage takes a week, a week and a half. Like, and ah, I almost go crazy because I'm a very active person, and I, I I can't stand not being able to not function. So that that gets me gets me going big time. Well, I often wonder who's kicking me in my sleep. And making me hurt so bad in the mornings when I get up, you know, <laughs> I, just, I feel like somebody beats me up in my sleep and then I get up and it takes me about two hours to <laughs> kind of be able to halfway move. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, what's the old saying? I wish somebody would tell me I was in the good times when I was in the good old days, in the good old days when I was in the good old days, you know, and it's kind of the, it, it's, it's that thing, you know, it's uh i mean it's some i think everybody at least anybody's competitive uh goes through yeah now last time we had last time we had you on Kristen, you were talking a little bit about um you know staying active you know what you do for working out and stuff like that and you were talking a little bit about mountain biking now was mountain biking something you've always kind of done or was that something you kind of picked up after racing well not really like in in uh, 97 I started mm -hmm. uh, road biking, and then oh, okay. especially a after my accident in, in Australia, um, I used to run a lot prior to that. And then after my accident, obviously because uh, my, my leg couldn't take any any huge impacts, I started riding a lot the bike and swimming, and and then I sort of rode my road bike for a good like 10, 12 years and, and up to like a decent level, like pounding around doing like 10,000 miles per year, like uh, 9,000 miles, like sometimes even like a little bit more depending on the year. So obviously far from being a pro, but uh, I was putting on a, a decent amount of uh, miles. And then in 2009, I sort of, I got a little bit bored of it because the only time I really had some fun was when I was 
in in like a gaggle of other bikes like in a big pack and a big peloton and but at the same time it, it was a little bit dangerous because yeah there were some guys that knew how to ride very well so i was comfortable around them but uh sometimes you would get these packs of about like 30 50 bikes and and mm. uh, you were around like almost rubbing shoulders with with uh, people that I didn't know like I I really didn't know their their skill level and and I didn't know if they would would freak out and, and then pretty much like generate like a huge accident because to fall in the middle of a pack is 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 one of the easiest things that you can do like uh, unless if you stay ahead of the pack all the time so then I started rethinking and said okay I rode my bike for so many years and now it got to the point that it's a little bit boring um so what can I do on the bike side? And then I started uh, mountain biking first uh, cross country. And then I did some races and all that stuff. And it, and it was fun, but um, there wasn't enough of the driving, like in the cross country stuff. And uh, then I migrated to the uh, like enduro stuff and more enduro slash downhill stuff. And that was 10 times more fun. Like uh, I have to admit, maybe a little bit more there's the risk factor in the middle, maybe a little bit more dangerous, but uh, now you're, you're really driving it. And, and believe it or not, there's a lot of stuff that I learned throughout my racing career in cars throughout the 38 years that I use exactly the same when I ride nowadays, especially when you're apexing corners and, and uh, breaking points and, and how much do you break intensity and, and this and that and and that helped me a lot and, and for sure it accelerated my my learning curve process like immensely and uh, nowadays i i really have fun with with uh, all that stuff and and every now and then when i can do some uh heli bike drops and and like uh just just enjoy my time there like um, i'm not I'm not doing anything competitive. I don't have any intentions, but uh, I ride hard and and uh, hard. I ride hard to my level and then uh, pretty much just try to enjoy myself as much as I can. So is there anything that you do that you get into that you don't get serious about? Like, can you, could you go, I want to say something dumb here. Could you go like fishing without, becoming like a competitive fisherman or could you go like driving a car things? driving a car nowadays it doesn't really matter if i'm in brazil if i'm in the u.s wherever i am like sorry my wording like i give a shit about going fast <laughs> like right. because a it's very dangerous when you do that sure. and b there's the law and and you have to be within the limitations of the law it doesn't matter if you're in brazil if you're in the us if you're in europe wherever you are so like if you can go at 80 miles an hour i just stick it on cruise control and and i'm doing 80 miles an hour if you have to do 75 i'll do 75 like the same thing here in brazil if you can go 120 k's i'll do 120 k's if you can go 100 a little bit more which i doubt it uh, i'll go a little bit more but uh that's pretty much it. Like that, that definitely uh, I'm on the, the other mode right now of, right. of uh, my life and, and I don't miss it. And, and, and I'm happy. And like, I don't have any speeding tickets and, and I could care less. Like you're, you're, it's so different when you drive a race car on a racetrack and people don't realize that people, sometimes I get a lot of people that hop in the car to go somewhere with me. And then, after we arrive, we leave point A and then we get to point B and then they, they look at me and they said, wow, what an experience. I thought you were really going to nail it. I said, nail what? Well, I said, no, go fast. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> like driving on the street has nothing to do with uh, driving uh, a car like uh, on, on well, a road course or, or a street course. Well, like you just said, like road racing on with a bike or road riding with a bike in a large pack, the other drivers aren't professional 
drivers. They're not, you know, your abilities way outweigh what they can do. So well, yeah, and, and you, you know, well, you, you 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 can you can get yourself in a bad situation because somebody else has no idea what they're doing. Yeah, the, 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 you you actually hit a very interesting point, and and what I was comfortable when I like let's use the pack situation, which is a very good example that you just brought up. Like I was in the pack. If I was one finger away, two fingers away from the bike ahead of me, if I was almost rubbing shoulders with the guy next to me, then like I, I was 100% comfortable in me being close to the guy either in front of me or next to me. I didn't have a problem. I wasn't comfortable because I didn't know who the guy was. It's different right. if I'm racing with Michael, if I'm racing with Tracy, if I'm racing because I know that they're – like they're not going to pull any crazy moves like you so you you're you're basically running around at a super speedway just like side by side with those guys and on the bike like when you're in a pack I was okay like I didn't care if I was close to someone but to your point if someone in front of me that was nervous about it that wasn't comfortable being there generated an accident like it, it was going to be a big one. Like it, it was going to sure. be a big wreck. Like, like you have like on a super speedway for, for the cup cars, like almost every single time that they go out, like they are going to wreck. It's there. There is going to be a big one sooner or later. So that's pretty much it. But um, I think the racing experience helped me a lot because your perception of everything changes your speed perception your your what you can do what you can't do when you're really in that fine line of going into the danger zone and not going into the danger zone and messes with your comfort level with pretty much everything and and that really gave me a good idea of of what I can do and, and what I, I couldn't do like what I couldn't do like I had I have my panic button inside my <laughs> my mind and and when I get close to it and I know that something's bad is gonna happen like I just press it and off the gas I go that's it <laughs> now talking about like tr trust trusting other people like when you're when you're bike riding like not knowing what the other person's gonna do like how I can relate to that is most recently we've done a couple videos with um, former drivers and actually a current driver as well. Um, Jagger Jones, who drives actually Indy Lights this year, we're, we race go karts. And when I say we, Scott, Scott's go kart days are long gone, but yes. I race go karts against Jagger and then also Robbie McGee at St. Louis. And it really puts things in perspective. Like, even if it's a retired race car driver trying to race, uh, anyone who's was pro or is pro, whatever, any capacity. It's a completely different animal. Like it's not even, I mean, there's no, I can't, you can't compete with that. Um, and I'm sure it's kind of the same thing. Like when they're going around me, they're like, what's he going to do? He's going to do something stupid and wreck me. Um, but there, I will say professional drivers are so easy to raise go-karts with because they do all the work. Like you don't even have to get out of the way. They move you out of the way. So um, no, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I don't know. It, Remember that we've been doing this stuff our absolutely. whole lives, so it's almost second nature for us. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and 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 there are some stupid things that I see like on the road sometimes, and I'm sure, and and like the way people drive and the way people stab the brakes and the way they uh, like apex corners and everything like it. I'm gonna be honest with you. It it, it makes me laugh inside the car. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I I look at the situation and I start questioning myself. Like, where the heck is that guy going? Like, <laughs> and and probably in the car he thinks that he's doing the most correct thing on the face of the planet, which obviously he isn't. But uh, yeah, it it is what it is. Like, and and uh, I guess each one of us are comfortable with with their environments that they have the most amount of experience and and a lot of people ask me like okay now i'm gonna go off the tangent here a little bit like at the end of the day treating racing as a job like uh, it's a job like any other and 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 some people don't understand that a lot of people yeah. think it's only a sport but it's a job like any other like 
you have your good days, you have your bad days, you have the days where there's more pressure on you, you have the days where there's less pressure on you. And if you ask a CEO of a bank, for example, he's probably going to ask you, the, he's probably going to answer you the same thing. Like uh, there is right. the good days, the bad days, when, when a, a situation gets a little bit more mellow, when it's more tense, when, when there's more pressure, less pressure, pressure. Probably the only difference is that he's not running around at, at 200 miles an hour, like whatever it is. Like, uh, so, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I did it for a, a long time. I, I just treat it as a, as a job, like, like uh, any other. You just go to the track, put your pajamas on and then, and, 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 and treat it as, as man, it's, it's what you have to do. That's it. Period. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, are you the kind of person that loves to win or do you hate to lose? Because they are two different things. Um, okay. With rare exceptions, with the probably Schumachers of the situation, the Hamiltons and and whatever, like one guy or another, if, if you pick every single driver out there, and, and if you average out their racing careers, everyone is going to lose more than they're going to oh, win. Oh, way more. Exactly. Way but more. But every time you win or every time you have a successful race, it, it's not only the wins. Like sometimes right. I have done a bunch of races where whatever, I started on the grid 15th, 20th, maybe even further back, like deeper in the field. And 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 went on to finish a good top five that for me was a lot more enjoyable than actually winning a race because man i really really drove my heart out there and i knew i was absolutely on on the limit from lap one until the very last lap so yeah uh, i think i like i like both obviously to win but i i put win as far as having a successful race also yeah like that's I, how i, I view it too yeah i sort of put both of them together the day that you leave the track on sunday afternoon and you say wow i didn't win the race today but i drove the thing in a way that i know that i extracted absolutely everything that i could out of the car um, and your, your second question, uh, yeah, I hate losing. <laughs> There's no doubt about right. it. But I don't have a problem when I got beat fair and square. I don't right. because sure. the other guy was just better than my, me or my organization or both of us together, whatever. So that means we need to go back home and we need to do our homework properly or need to improve on our homework skills and then take another crack at it. Um, I don't have a problem with that, and I never did. What I have a problem with is, for example, you're doing well, you're doing well, and the car, like a mechanical, lets you down at the end of the race. A, a situation completely beyond your control. Oh, sorry about that. My cat's trying to jump up on the thing. <laughs> I'm trying to stop him from jumping up on this table. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Just like, just like you no just worries. did. Get out. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So, yeah. I could see it in his eyes. I knew he was going to do it. So, going back to what I was mentioning, yeah, uh, I have a problem with that. Like when, when, when the car lets you down, when, um, for example, there's a pileup and you get collected. And you're you're the fourth car to get collected, and you had nothing to do with with the right. whole with the whole mess, and you just got collected. I have a problem with that. Now you're running hard with someone else, another competitor, and you, you both of you tangle. Yeah, it happens. It's gonna happen. Obviously, when we were in the twenties, it was never our fault. It was always the other guy's fault, and this and that, whatever. But that's going to happen to you eventually. But the things that tick me off the most is 
when you get collected and you don't have nothing to do with the mess or right when you have a mechanical problem also when, and everything was dead perfect, you were driving the car correctly, everything mm-hmm. was fine, and, and, and the car just gave up on you. Well, you know, you take like someone, something like, um, like you just mentioned, you get caught up in one of those giant NASCAR crashes or especially in NASCAR at times, you know, people try to take revenge on each other, cause a crash, you get caught up in it, just stuff like that. Just, I mean, everybody spends so much time and money and effort to get there. And then, you know, you get caught up in something like that. It, it, it that's the stuff that is just, Mind, I mean, to me, auto racing is a sport of perseverance, overcoming the difficult days to enjoy the good days. To me, that's what auto racing is. And, uh, and it's just, it's funny though to hear different people's perspective of it, perspective of it. Yeah. It's someone asked me, I said, when you have a successful day or when you win, that counts as 20 times that you lost. That's right. Uh, I, I would absolutely agree you, with that. You, you, you sort of forget your bad days completely, and you turn the page, you move on, and, and you cherish the good day that you just had as much as you can. And, and immediately, this is like already start preparing for the next one because right. what I learned pretty early in life and in racing is you're only as good as your last result. So on, on Tuesday... Yeah. People remember you on Monday, but on Tuesday, they already forgot everything that happened. So you might as well get your act together and and, and make sure that you're going to be competitive on the next one because life is not going to wait for you. So you, you need to be on top of your A game all the time. If you're not on top of your A game, you're you're going to fail sooner or later. That That's that's common sense. That That's pretty dirt. Like... <laughs> Any any kid can understand that uh, unless you want to live like a, a complete different life, which is not as competitive, not you don't have so many ambitions, you don't want to try and, and be rubbing wheels or in, in like rubbing wheels is, right. is only the terminology that I'm using with with the best in your area and 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 this and that so it's it, it it's what you what you decide to aim for 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 your life that's it right and my, my cat's name's simon pagino by the way like pagino he uh i guess he <laughs> wanted to meet you i don't know but sorry about that um you know it, it's it's uh you you kind of brought it up and being on your A game, and Aaron and I were talking about this. Um, you we talk about the difficulties in the sport, and then you know IndyCars had such an amazing season, and then you look at some a situation like an Alex Pelot, where you know he's he everybody's having to put off track stuff. I mean, it is on track, but off track stuff away, you know, for the race weekends. And I think they've done an amazing job of doing it. Um, I mean, it, I guess what I'm getting as, I mean, how do you, how do you compartmentalize that? Like, okay. Can you rephrase the question again? Well, so, I mean, like when you're facing something so difficult that's so intrinsic with the team. Ah, okay. No, and then, it, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I, I, I no, work no, 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 very, the, the, very I, lately I, sometimes. No, I, I know exactly where you're going and I don't have any problem talking about it. I am surprised that someone of a caliber of a polo with the talent he has and everything, whoever works together with him, in my opinion, didn't probably guide him in the best path because Mm -hmm. someone of his age that had was so successful so early that has god knows how many years ahead of him like probably if he wants an indy car another 15 20 20, 15 20 seasons ahead of him like that's a lot of seasons you're probably going to get bored before you get to season number 20 (laughs) right um so 
how can he find himself or put Polo in this mess? Like, I, I honestly don't understand. If the situation is not the best with Chip, at least you're running competitive cars. Like, Chip also did an extremely awesome job because he gave you a competitive winning car which you knew how to capitalize on it the previous season so i don't know what his deal is with chip what his deal is with zach and everything but let's put it this way chip gave him the opportunity um he he stuck behind it you won the season maybe when you renew your contract with him, maybe it's not your best financial deal. Maybe Zach is throwing more money ahead, like in front of you and everything. But Jesus, it's not that you're in your last year of your racing career. Like, look how many seasons you had ahead of you. And, and we can't have it all. <laughs> we like, there's a little bit of give and take here. And okay, maybe financially, it's not the best deal continuing with Chip, but I have a better opportunity with Zach and I don't know if Zach was promising a Formula One ride or I think what that was the heck yeah. it is. And, and, but, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not bad mouthing Chip, Zach or, or, sure. or Polo here. I just think it's, it's, it's the situation, a situation that he should never be, be in. He, he shouldn't have be in this situation to start with. Whoever's fault it was, we're not discussing this. We're not discussing if Zach lied to him, if right, if, sure. if 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 Polo didn't have a manager that could see all these uh, stuff, all, all this mess, like sort of building itself up. If it was Chip here, we're not discussing any of that. The, the, my point is, a guy of his talent, with what he did last year, and with the years that he has ahead of him with an organization that he is already in right now. He is a champion with Ganassi, which is one of the best organizations out there to be. So, dude, take the chill pill. Like, enjoy the ride a little bit more with, with Chip and then go seek other stuff some other time. Like, And, and if he thought that he was going to get a Formula 1 ride, I have bad news for you. You're not going to get a Formula One ride. <laughs> it, it, it's right. not going to happen. Like, okay, maybe you're going to, could be a reserve driver. Maybe you can get a, a test in Formula One. But right now, it's not going to happen. Maybe in the near, near future, it could happen. But it's, it's just, just think a little bit about it. Check out the whole scenario. How many F1 seats are available for next year? And where are the opportunities that you could be in and this and that? And you know it's not going to happen. And what ended up happening? He generated, or he, I don't know who it was, like, but the whole mess was generated. And someone that races against him is probably going to get a Formula One seat. <laughs> probably. So uh, I, I, I don't understand. Like, to me, it was a lose-lose situation for Hello. Like I, I, I don't see where this whole mess is is benefiting him. Not to talk about the fact that the 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 guys that work very hard on his car, engineers, Chip, everyone loses the faith on the driver because they start thinking like, "Wow, wh why am I going to stay here until late at night?" to prepare the car for my driver that I want badly for him to win. And he really doesn't want to drive for us. Like, right. so why should I put all my effort into the program? So going back a little bit, I, I, I honestly didn't see any, any win-win situation. I, I think it's a mess for Polo. I think it's a mess for Ganassi. And I think it's a mess for Zach right now. And it's a lose-lose situation for everyone. All, all of these three entities uh, are losing out big time. And the only one that's gaining, believe it or not, is IndyCar as a sport. Because more people are talking about IndyCar because of, of the mess. Like, 
talk well or talk bad, but talk about me. <laughs> so right. it, it, IndyCar is getting some free publicity there. Is it, sure. That's the, 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 only, the only entity that, that is benefiting itself from the whole mess. Apart from that, I, I honestly don't see anything. Not to talk about, if you tell me that his season wasn't affected by that, he's lying. There's absolutely no way that he sure. went to bed every Friday night and every Saturday night. And and look at the stats. It like he's he hasn't dropped out of the championship or or he has. I can't no, I can't. No, no, no. He he's still one of the five that can is he? he might be, yeah. No, 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 no. I think he dropped out. I Him think he's Paco dropped out. Dropped I think out. he's like yeah, six exactly. in points. Yeah, and I think uh, only yeah, top exactly. five. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, him and Pato just dropped out, but up to Portland. He was probably lying, what, P4 in the championship, if I'm not mistaken. And he didn't have one single win. Right. And, and if you look at the stats of New Garden, for example, which to me is was, was the best driver in Indy this year, was Joseph. Um, the amount of uh, race wins he had and, and and not to talk about the races that he lost because of a mechanical because of this this and that was was huge compared to to uh, Palo and and, and Palo has the talent there's absolutely no doubt about it You're like when he was a rookie on his first year he already proved that running a couple of races extremely strong and then not to talk about last year and what amazed me Last year, when I was watching the races, was for someone his age, he he understood very well when he had the car to win, and when he didn't have the car to win, he would accept finishing fourth, fifth, or sixth with a, a very positive attitude and putting a spin into the game and sort of okay, we'll get them next time. Like I'm on track for the championship. Like. I'm scoring points. I couldn't win this weekend, but I'm scoring my points. And guess what happened? Bingo. He won the championship at the end of the year. He was a kid, but driving like someone that was like 30, 35 years old. So all of that was extremely impressive last year. But uh, unfortunately, this year, he definitely didn't capitalize on, on, on everything, in my opinion, on, on everything that he impressed the whole world last year. Yeah, and it's so strange. Um, I mean, because you could have said right up until that moment that as much as Scott Dixon has done, and Scott Dixon's whatever, you know, one of the greatest ever. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I honestly felt like it really was Pelot's team. Like, I felt like Ganassi was really Alex Pillow now. Um, and he had the finishes, and he, like you said, he had the smart finishes on top of everything else. And uh, he, the way he would finish out races, he'd, you know, point them and point them and point them to death. And eventually you figure he's going to get a win here or win there and be right in the hunt for the championship. And then he, everything just one day just goes haywire. And <laughs> You know, it's just like, you, you know, what's sad is, is people now have opinions about him, and I don't have it. I, I mean, he seems like a, a, a great guy. I, you know, obviously, I don't know him. Um, but now people have opinions about him that aren't so great, and, you know, people talk about him. And like you said, the only, the only people who really get anything out of it is IndyCar itself. And, you know, it's it's hurt his reputation or or however you want to put it, you know. Yeah, it's it hasn't. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it has. Again, if he was on his way out, if he was right. probably the last two or three years, yeah, man, I want to try something different. Like I have been associated with Chip for so many years, and now I want to try something different. Or I want to drive for Zach because of this, this, or that. Or I want to like okay, understandable, but. And 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 even if he did that at the end of his career would be half understandable, but at the same time wouldn't be understandable because Chip would have put in a lot of effort behind him throughout <coughs> all the years, and 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 then he would have jumped ships 
right at the very end. But uh, the point is, I was surprised when the whole mess started. Like I was, I was extremely surprised coming right. from from a guy that has so much talent at such a young age that drove unbelievably well last year that had the maturity of a guy that was really old i started questioning myself like how can he have shown the maturity that he had on the track and be so uh, immature outside of the track like i right. done, I, I honestly got a little bit confused again i don't know the story what i know is only reading and talking to some people sometimes and this is completely my opinion maybe if i knew the whole story i would have a different opinion but of what i know i think i'm entitled to say what i think and, and, and that's why i thought you were the perfect person to ask this and i think social media really amplifies the situation right i don't know if this would have happened necessarily when you were racing indy cars um because social media wasn't around i mean that was well, the reason why this all kind yes of exploded. yes I, I i think social media nowadays I think it helps everyone and it hinders everyone, not only in the racing world, uh, like even whatever, whatever world you want to pick, like uh, a lot more gossip is generated nowadays and, and easy access because you just write something and you press the button and then the whole world can know what you're thinking and what you wrote and where you're going and what you're doing. And if it's right or wrong, like it's not your problem people, anymore. People Suddenly lost jobs. Yeah, like everyone's problem, and and or or at least everyone is is looking at what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I I think social social media nowadays is is a pretty lethal weapon if used incorrectly. If used oh, correctly. Yeah. We've I seen think it's it. very yeah. beneficial for you, but if used incorrectly, it can be very, very lethal. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm off all social media. I, I just, it, it's such a wasteland, man. I, and you, you know, and then you, you see things, and you're like, it kind of makes you angry, and you want to respond, and you realize, hey, that's not smart. Uh, and you know, and I just like, I got off all social media. I just, I'm not mature enough to handle it, I guess. <laughs> but. uh you know, um, and you've seen a lot of racing contracts. And, I mean, if, if Formula One was something he really wanted, you would have thought they would have written that into the contract and he would have had a chance to maybe buy himself out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if that was a goal. Well, Chip is, uh, sorry, Zach is connected to a Formula One organization. Um, right. Chip isn't. Right. So what I imagine happened there is through Zach, Palo saw a bigger opportunity or he had a bigger shot through Zach in, in right. eventually doing Formula One than he did through Chip. Like Chip wouldn't right. help him. Chip, for obvious reasons, I would do the same. Right. Like Because Chip's interest is to try and, and keep him as much right. as he can. And, and, and the day he can't keep him anymore, he's going to sell his contract. Okay, if I can't keep the talent, at least I'm going to make money on the talent because right. I put all my time and effort on him. So I'm 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 not I'm simply not going to burn that. I'm not going to waste that. I'm not going to let it go for nothing. So that has a price to it, and uh, I, I think maybe he saw a bigger opportunity through Zach than than for sure he did through yeah. through Chip. Sure. Yeah, I, I'd say you're right. Well, we're not going to keep you much longer. I mean, you're always so generous with your time. We left a cliffhanger last time. Best racing story. Best racing story. Yep. What is your best racing story? Um, Something at least PG. Not necessarily, no. <laughs> uh, well... A good one was uh, we were having dinner once in Vancouver, and then Carl, when we didn't have any sponsorship commitments, he always 
took uh, both drivers and and whoever was together with him like in the race weekend to go out and, and eat with us so we were at a table probably 10 15 people uh, uh, carl bernie paul like uh, probably one or two sponsors michael myself and then mario was probably together with us and then uh like it, it's time for us to leave because obviously we had the race uh the next day and then Carl starts looking for the car keys. Oh, where are the car keys? They're like, Bernie, I can't find the car keys with his cigar in his mouth. And, like, where are the car keys? And, and then uh, Bernie was very, very, like, very polite, very contained and, and very extremely quiet. And, and, and she looked at him, oh, Carl, I can't find the car keys and, and this and that. And, so then we looked under the table, we started putting our hands in all our pockets and where are the car keys, where are the car keys, where are the car keys? Okay, make a long story short, he left the car keys with the engine running in the car and, and, and the car <laughs> locked itself. And when we got to the parking lot, there was a huge puddle of water underneath because of the AC, it was running all the time. <laughs> and it was dripping. And, 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 and the car keys were in the car, the car was locked and the car stayed running for two hours, two hours and a half all the time that we were in the restaurant. And then, well, Again, shortening the story again, drivers got a cab, went straight to the hotel, and then uh, he had to call, I think, uh, an Avis or a Hertz guy and, and uh, get a second key and, and uh, open it up. And off he went to the hotel. And the other funny story was when the Swift chassis was ready, um, the, 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 like the, the nose cone was ready, but the front wings weren't ready for whatever reason, like coming out of the oven, they, 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 they there was a little problem. They were delayed and everything. So the car was in homes to, to go running, but we were lacking the front wings. So then the plan was, uh, hop in the car, go out, do a couple of installation laps, obviously don't run at speed because it would be completely unbalanced, but bring it up to speed oh not bring it up to speed like run decent uh, speed but not obviously like run 60 70 percent of what the car can do at least go through all the gears so we can start running the next day because the wings were supp supposed to arrive during that day so um i i parked the car after the first practice and then everyone was anxious waiting for the wings and and we had to fedex them from uh, california so the first fedex guy arrived and the the first one arrived at the track and then coincidentally when he got to the to the to the garages and he saw a new one house and this oh it's here but it wasn't the front wings that he was delivering so carl was right next to the car and and he looked at the fedex guy and and he was all pumped up already. And then the guy was trying to, hey, like I brought some stuff for you and this and that. And then he looked at him, is it the front wings? And, and the guy obviously was only doing his job. It wasn't his fault or anything. He didn't have a clue what he was delivering and it wasn't the front wings, but he didn't have a clue. And he <laughs> sort of shrugged his shoulders and, <laughs> and then Carl looked at him and he said, you know what? You're fired. Get out of here. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then we had to calm Carl down. Obviously, it wasn't him. Like, he was so nervous because the front wings weren't ready. And it was the swift debut and this and that. He was, like, really, really, really over ready and firing everyone and this and that. And it was said, Carl, Carl the FedEx guy doesn't work for you. <laughs> like It doesn't work this way. Like the wings are going to arrive, but it's not going to be in this package. It's going to be later in the day and this and that. So, uh, and, and again, it, 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 that was not the Carl Haas that we were seeing. Like that sure. was someone that was extremely nervous that had a lot at stake. Like he invested a lot of money and, and, and completely understandable. And, and, and something like that, someone had failed down the road, like, because the whole car was ready. <laughs> Only the front wings were not ready. So 
someone had to take the blame, like, or someone was at blame for the failure, but it definitely wasn't the FedEx guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, um, well, uh, Kristen, we really appreciate. I your mean, time. does he does the FedEx guy have to go back to HR and say, "Hey, the guy from Newman Haas fired me. Do I still have a job? I mean, how does that work?" Well, do you know what? That's a huge problem. That's not mine. So I don't yeah, know what right. was the outcome of that story. <laughs> that's right. It's it's like the National Lampoons. Um, that um, what was it? The Christmas Vacation one, Scott, where they're all gathered around. Or no, it was um. Christmas story where they're all gathered around. They're opening the box thinking that, you know, he was getting a bonus and it was for the jelly bean club or whatever. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it, it's like at the same time, at the end of the, uh, sorry, every year I, I did that for what, seven years, six years, seven years. No, maybe even more, but every year Carl would open his house completely and invite the whole team all the sponsors everyone that was associated with the organization for a christmas party and he would open the house completely like you could go in anywhere in the house and i think what he was trying to say is because of you guys i have all this right so i want to thank you guys and the minimum I can do is sort of try and, and, and experience these couple of hours and have some fun and have a laugh here and drink some wine and, and, and enjoy everything that we are, like all the hardships that we go through the whole season, try to unwind and, and relax a little bit and, and have a nice time at the end of the year and and I, I i thought that was extremely cool and and that was that was him like to the point that like, one day i arrived and it was snowing uh snowing pretty good and the only part of 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 the of the roads that didn't have any snow on was his driveway so he, he would usually be waiting for for like people to arrive and he would keep going in and out of uh, of the house and this and that and coincidentally when i arrived I, I got out of the car and then he looked at me and the first thing he said with his cigar in his mouth is hey, don't you think that my driveway is really cool and then i looked at him i said cool why carl it's, like, ah, it's the only place that there's no snow on it like all the rest of of, of the city and town and everything is packed with snow <laughs> Because it was all heated, <laughs> but right. he, he like he never did that because he was arrogant. Like he never did it. Like he was he was the guy. Like and and I think there is probably one week that I don't remember him one way or the other. <laughs> and right. the amount of stuff I learned with him was unreal like and and really like I, I i really owe a lot to him and and i don't know i i only have great stuff to talk about that gentleman like he was he was absolutely more than first class like he was 12. All right no that's that's awesome and i, I think that's great because for whatever reason he gets kind of lost in the in the shuffle of talking about the great owners of uh of IndyCar racing. So thank you for sharing those. Yeah. Yeah, no, great times. And uh again, it's only cool memories that we'll cherish for the rest of our lives. Right. Well, Christian, thank you so much um once again for being on. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, no, thank you guys very much. Uh, hopefully, uh, we had some cool stories out of it. And uh, let's wait for the dust to settle down. And uh, if you guys want, just give me a shout and we'll do another one next year sometime. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Take man. Care. And uh, all the best to you guys.